So welcome uh, everyone to this call. This is the BISC Q1 2020 update call. Uh, it's the first time we've done anything like this in quite a while and there's a lot to cover, a lot to share. So I wanna jump right in, but first I wanna give a sense of what we're gonna cover. So we'll look at 2019 uh, in review, what happened last year, what we accomplished, et cetera. I want to lay out BISC's mission and vision. Um, this won't be anything uh, too new. We've said things like this before, but I think it's uh, going to be good to refresh our memory about that and take a moment to articulate it newly. Um, opportunities and challenges that lay before us. Goals for 2020. It's the most important part, right? This is what we're going to focus on going forward. And some organizational changes that we're making uh, effective immediately. So. Uh, this call is primarily intended for current and prospective contributors and BSQ stakeholders, but you know we opened up the inv invitation to everybody because I think a lot of what you see here is going to be very interesting to uh, users as well, uh, traders, market makers, etc. So really, um, it's for everybody. And uh, my intention is to go about 45 minutes with the content, and then we'll open it up for Q&A afterward okay so 2019 what did we do well we shipped 19 times right if you look at how many release tags there are in the repository we shipped 19 times so one and a half bisque releases per month and that's an upstat from 2018 we shipped about uh we shipped 11 times in 2018 so at some point it actually becomes too many releases right more is not necessarily better here but we, but the point is that we certainly had a cadence and uh, we shipped very regularly last year. So downloads, uh, we did 112,000 downloads of the actual binaries, the installables last year and 130,000 this year. So a little upstat. Contributions. So we had 105 unique contributors, right? You can just look at the Git log stats and that's up a little bit from last year from 92. We merged 592 pull requests, which was a considerable upstat from last year, about 400 last year. And total number of commits, just to get a gauge of things, right, about 2,000. We also did a little over 2,000 last year, so very similar. And what did we actually ship? Features, et cetera. Well, we launched BISC 1.0, major milestone, right? We've been live in production since 2016. Right, been developing since 2014, live since 2016, and last year, 2019, we shipped 1.0 because we shipped the BISC DAO, right? All the technical infrastructure of the DAO has been live since April of last year, running, running pretty smoothly, right? This whole thing actually works. BSQ works and has had a really pretty impressive run for, you know, the first uh, however many months of its life that is. So that's huge, right? And uh, we launched a new trade protocol, right? Significant changes to the trade protocol where we're no longer two of three multi-sig with, with an arbitrator holding the third key, which, is, which introduces some centralization, centralization risk. We've always known that. It's always been a bit of a weakness in the protocol and now we've eliminated that. We're in two of two multi-sig with a moderation model now and so on and so forth. You can read about this if you're not familiar, but the trade protocol got even more secure. We simplified and reduced trading fees, right? So it used to be kind of complicated to estimate what you were going to pay depending on how much of a premium they put on your trades and the distance from market price, et cetera. That's been reduced and simplified. Uh, we introduced account signing as yet another measure against potential bank account scammers. We had a couple of incidents last year and we responded swiftly and promptly and, you know, really innovated here I think we came up with a pretty clever solution uh, with account signing and that's been rolled out and continues to roll out as new users come in and get their account signed by existing users with signed accounts and so on and so forth uh, we introduced trader chat right so you can now track chat with your uh, counterparty in a trade that you've taken or that has been taken um, at any time right and this of course reduces uh, the need to go to mediation the need to open up support cases. You can just resolve things amongst yourselves in many cases. And uh, of course, the most important feature of all, dark mode. Every good app has to have a dark mode, and this certainly does now. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we had new highs for trading volume uh, across the board, really, in fiat and, you know, many other currency pairs, especially Monero, right? People who have been around this can spend a lot of time paying attention to the project, know that 2019 was absolutely enormous in Monero trading. Um, we introduced instant trading, right? So instant altcoin trading, which uh, essentially narrows down the trading window to an hour, right? So people can you know, trade much more quickly. Uh, lots and lots of bug fixes, performance improvements, et cetera. And, uh, you know, this isn't a feature per se, right? But something really important to note is that if you go back a couple of years, even to sort of mid 2017, uh, there was a whole lot of the Bitcoin community, you know, serious Bitcoiners, people really dedicated to the space, just didn't know what this was, even though we'd been working on it for years and it had been live for, you know, more than a year at that time. And uh, that was always a surprise to me. And, 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 and now in the intervening couple of years, that's really changed, right? If you're somebody who pays attention to Bitcoin podcasts and things like that, you know that this gets mentioned very, very frequently. And there's a, it just, just a widespread awareness of the project amongst those who care most about Bitcoin. So, you know, we've checked that box in a way that's never really done, but, you know, we're on the right side of that situation now. So certainly worth noting. Okay, some trading stats, right? We did 91% more total trades in 2019 and 2018. So a pretty big up stat. We did 2.6 times the total Bitcoin volume, right? So Bitcoin is always the base, base currency in every trade. So we often denominate statistics like this in BTC. So we did nearly 14,000 BTC worth of trading last year, up from about 5,000 in 2018. And then if you adjust all of those Bitcoin trades to USD at the market price, the time the trade was taken, we did four times uh, the USD adjusted volume. So 116 million in 2019 versus uh, just 30 million in 2018. So really you know, enormous uh, you know, difference. Not too bad, right? Pretty, pretty good 2019. But I want us to zoom out and you know, think about what are, we, what are we really doing here? What is this all about? And when we talk about BISC's mission, you know, in, in a way, this, I think this goes without saying, because I think the people who have shown up to this project historically, especially contributors uh, and many, many users, they show up at BISC because they are aligned with this mission, right? But it's good to take a moment to, to re-articulate it. So BISC's mission is to provide a safe and private way to buy and sell Bitcoin in exchange for national currencies and other cryptocurrencies. And we use peer-to-peer -peer technology to match buyers and sellers without any central authority, servers, or databases. Our audience is individuals around the world who wish to claim and preserve their right to financial freedom and privacy. And BISC is the exchange network that Bitcoin and its growing user base needs to realize a future of individual financial autonomy. So I'd like to hear your feedback about that mission if you have any. If it already hits the sweet spot, great, we're aligned, right? And vision, right? What's the difference between mission and vision? Vision is kind of the you know, mission is what we're building, who we're building it for, why we're building it, why it's valuable. The vision articulation is like, what really motivates us in the morning, right? Like, what are we achieving, accomplishing? What are we doing for ourselves in a way, really, as the contributors who are building this, who make up the BISC DAO, and so on. So, one, to become the widely accepted exchange layer of the Bitcoin protocol stack. Now, that's not something that we've talked a whole lot about in public. If you hang around me long enough, you've heard me talk about it, right? I think this is a real opportunity for us. If you look at the emerging Bitcoin protocol stack, right? Obviously, Bitcoin is the core, you know, first layer, right? Lightning showing up as the second layer for fast, uh, cheap transactions, private transactions, etc. There's a kind of BISC-shaped hole in that stack, which is how do you get into that stack, right? The Bitcoin protocol stack really needs an exchange layer. And right now, BISC provides that in a way, right? But it provides it as a, as a, a particular application with a P2P network. And I think there's a real opportunity to evolve BISC toward becoming a first-class protocol. And that has lots of implications. We won't get into it in detail here. 
but I, but I want to lay that out as part of, as part of the vision. And two is to be among the world's first successful decentralized autonomous organizations. Now, we already are one. We really do function as a DAO. Uh, you know, if you go look up the Wikipedia definition, we meet it, right? Now, are we successful? Well, by some measures, but we can be a lot more successful, for sure. I wouldn't say we've exactly proven ourselves just yet. Three, to do great work building privacy protecting, free and open source software that the world needs. This definitely motivates me every morning, right? To be accountable to our users and our stakeholders alone, and to see our contributors and stakeholders flourish and prosper. Those are all things, you know, this whole vision, it's really something that for me, it makes sense that I'm spending my time on this. And if it's the same for you too, then great, let's keep going. We've got work to do, right? To realize fully that mission and vision. There's much to be done. And that's what the rest of this deck is gonna be about, right? So opportunities, right? What lies before us? What can we do? Well, this space, right? The privacy protecting P2P, decentralized, distributed, fiat exchange space, right? And I say fiat there because that's really the heart and soul of this. Yes, we do altcoin trading and, you know, Maybe we have a particular focus on privacy coins. Maybe in the future we have a bit of a focus on stable coins, but it's really about providing a bridge to the fiat world, right? On and off ramps from the fiat world that are safe and private for people. That space is wide open. We are almost the only player there, right? There is a counted on one hand or less number of players that are even trying to do anything like what we're doing. And you know, people are beginning to know, and I think we can really grow this pie. We can attract massive new liquidity with the API that we're building out. This is key in the goals that we're coming up to. We can reach more users by building light mobile clients. The API is gonna be critical to being able to do that as well. Uh, we can expand to non-custodial trading on Lightning, right? There's so much we can do. Like I said, we can evolve toward becoming a first-class exchange protocol. We can become the exchange layer of the Bitcoin protocol stack. All of these things are possible, but we've got challenges, right? We have some things that we need to work out in order to be able to achieve those kinds of things. Uh, we have very, very constrained dev capacity. We really just have a few core developers who are capable inside the code base of getting done what most needs to get done. We have reduced volumes in the last, uh, say, three, four, or five months that have led to lower revenues, right? So the income into the DAO of BSQ, the revenues coming in and how we compensate ourselves, that's been lowered in the last months. So that's certainly a challenge. Uh, poor liquidity, right? One of the number one things that people say when they try out BISC is, where's the liquidity? Where's the liquidity? Well, of course, right? It's very important. Plus, a difficult onboarding experience is another key feedback that we get from people. BISC is too complicated, too hard to use, I can't figure it out, right? It means a lot of would-be new users don't end up staying. And I would say we have a hit and miss user support experience. Very often, it's very good, right? Uh, and very often, or often at least, we hear from users saying they can't get a hold of somebody or they didn't get a response or what have you, right? Throughout the history of the project, you know, Manfred, the, the uh, 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 creator of BISC and, you know, my original co-founder, um, always was quick to say, you know, we don't have professional support. We're not a company. We don't have professional support. Don't expect it, right? In the early days, it was totally appropriate to give that disclaimer. You know, we, it was a best effort thing, right? We did the best that we could. Now that changes, right? The stage that we're at, the phase that the project is in, we really do need to provide professional, kick-ass user support experience, right? So more to come on that. And uh, reliability issues, right? This has some bugs and it lands people in support too often. Not very often, but often enough that you know, we really need to focus on this and uh, squash those. And I would say insufficient management, right? Really almost no management has meant that too often we fail to do what is most essential. And that's an artifact of, you know, when we launched the DAO, we really went for it, right? We said, okay, but this is a totally decentralized, right? We defined all of the roles and so on, all of the infrastructure of the DAO. We now self-manage, right? And we tried that. We gave that a real 
try over the last many months since the Dow launched. And now's the time to call the shot and say, okay, good try, not sufficient, right? We need to do something different now. So we want to introduce some practical management and administration to the project that can ensure that we get the right things done. Um, these are user feedback uh, mentions. You know, we give a survey to people every time they complete a trade with, uh, with BISC, first time they complete a trade with BISC, we ask them if they, if they want to fill out a feedback format. And this is some of the common mentions in what people bring up in that form, right? So you see the, the usual suspects, right? If you know BISC, uh, people want a mobile app, right? People want SegWit support. Uh, liquidity, 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 user experience, user experience, user experience. These are huge things. So when we talk about these in, in the upcoming goals, right, this is really based on, you know, staying in touch with the real world, right? We're not just guessing about this stuff. We do actually have a strong sense of what people want and need. So to succeed in all of this, we have to take on both these opportunities and the challenges at the same time. We can't just stop everything and try to fix the problems. And we can't ignore the problems and go try, you know, for the moon, right? We have to do the most important of these things at the same time. And we can do it with the goals and the changes that we're making that fall in. So what are those goals for 2020? Simple, increase liquidity, improve the support experience, improve BISC's reliability, and improve the onboarding experience. So I want to walk through each one of these and talk briefly about, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it, right? This is the strategic goal, increase liquidity. Duh, most important thing ever. Okay, yeah, but how are we actually going to do it? What are the tactics? And then how are we going to know that we did it? How are we going to measure that? What are the metrics? So let's, let's cruise through each one of those at a high level. So increasing liquidity, how do we do it? Well, one is that we need to focus on our key markets. We know what our key markets are. It's USD, it's Euro, it's Monero. We have a lot of Zcash trading as well, right? But let's say for the moment, these three, and we really nail them down. Now, it's not that there's no liquidity here. You know, at any given time, you see 30, 40 offers in each one of those markets. But, you know, like in Monero, it's very often very large offers, no small offers, right? In the, in the USD and Euro market, it's the same thing. There's a whole lot of, you know, kind of 70, 100 Euro dollar offers, but not necessarily a whole lot of, uh, you know, depth, right? If you really want to go buy a bunch of Bitcoin worth of Euros or so. So, so we want to do the right things by market makers, right? Like we want to attract market makers to help build out the right kind of liquidity, the right balance of liquidity in those markets. And like I mentioned before, absolutely crucial to this, we think, is shipping what we call the BISC daemon and API. So what is the BISC daemon? So anybody familiar with you know, running a Bitcoin core node and so on will understand what Bitcoin D is. Anybody understand, you know, familiar with Unix systems programming and so on knows what a daemon is. Essentially, it's a headless BISC that you can run conveniently in any environment, right? So on a VPS or on a Raspberry Pi sitting on your bedroom shelf or what have you, no desktop UI bits in there, which make it much more difficult and a bit more heavyweight to, to run in certain environments, right? So a headless BISC that can run anywhere and an API that you can access it programmatically with, right? That you can script, that you can write trading bots, right? The technical market makers can come along and automate what they want to do with BISC. Today, it's all clickety-click in the UI. And that just doesn't scale, right? There, there are better ways for market makers to go make money than having to come back to the BISC UI over and over and over again. So we think the API is absolutely enormous to enabling this. And uh, at the same time, right, it's not just enough to ship the technical bits. We really have to do the footwork in the community, right? Growth efforts, liquidity bounties, getting out there and really connecting with market makers, right? We're pretty good at connecting with Bitcoiners who want the right kind of privacy solutions for exchanging, right? That, that's, you know, that's who I am, right? So I'm pretty good at finding them and talking to them and understanding them and building something for them. But we now need to go talk to these other audiences, especially market makers. So how do we know that we're going to do that? This is a very abbreviated provisional list of these metrics. It's just, just high level here. So we want to measure 
what matters to users, essentially, right? So whether you're you know, a casual user who just wants to exchange some Bitcoin for some euros to pay your bills, or you're a market maker who wants to you know, really interact with BISC to make a profit, right? What do users care about? Well, what does it cost me to take one Bitcoin worth of offers? If I'm somebody who wants to accumulate one Bitcoin, how much am I going to have to pay to do that above the market price, right? So I'm calling that premium here, right? Called distance from market price in the, in the application. Am I going to pay 1% more than market price? Am I going to end up paying 10% more, right? So that cost really matters and we want to measure that. The better the liquidity, the lower that cost should come down approaching the market price, right? The number of trades that are required to take, say, one Bitcoin worth of offers. Well, it's going to be at least four right now because we have a cap on fiat trades, at least, of a quarter of the Bitcoin. But do you end up in practice having to actually take 10 trades because they're all very small, right? Or can you really just get away with four? Uh, the amount of BTC on offer, the total depth of any given market, right? Say BTC, USD, how much Bitcoin can I buy or sell in that market? Uh, and so on, right? And, you know, total volume numbers and so on. Um, but we're going to rigorously track this and publish this and really manage to this, which is something that we've always had certain numbers like this in mind, but we haven't really managed what we're doing to those numbers. And we're going to begin that. Okay, so that's liquidity in a nutshell. Improve the support experience. So, you know, the rationale is clear. Uh, stuff happens, right? People end up in support. That's not going to change. It's always going to be some new bug. There's always going to be human error. That's why we have support. Um, and the thing is, you know, and everybody knows this, right? Like, a, a, a company, an organization can, can screw up pretty badly, but if you have a great support experience, you probably stick around as a user. If you don't, you're probably gone, right? So, you know, organizations live and die on the quality of their support, and we want to really acknowledge and respect that. So, it's time to professionalize, right? And like I said, build a reputation for BISC, that we have kick-ass user support, right? People know that no matter what happens, they come in, they're going to get taken care of. So how do we do that? Well, a couple of quick things on the tactics front. Again, very simple, the things that kind of any organization would do, right? We formalize a level one, level two support and escalation process. We already have level one. We haven't really been talking about it in that term, but now we call it that term. That's all the support agents that we already have, right? Just doing the work every day of being in the support key base channel of uh, you know, monitoring the forum, whatever it may be, and answering users' questions. And normally, they can just get that done in many, many cases. But when they can't, there's a new question or a problem that's maybe too technical or something like that, they need to escalate. And so level two is dev, right? But we want to formalize that process where we have devs on call, uh, you know, ideally every day of the week, right? We'll get what coverage we can and we'll expand as we have more developers. But we want to give support agents the lifeline that they need, right? They know who to go to, they know who's responsible. It's not a, it's not a crapshoot, right? It's not haphazard. Um, and, you know, to support that, we'll, you know, build out simple coverage calendars and just additional probably Google calendars like we already have for BISC events. And, you know, support agents will register themselves when, when they're available and so on. I've talked to most of the people doing support and everybody is, is uh, aligned with this so far. So, you know, we'll, we plan to roll this out just um, essentially immediately, just as quickly as possible and begin improving us right away. So the second thing that we know we're going to do is introduce a knowledge base. Um, this is actually already an in-flight um, uh, project. Uh, essentially just, you know, it, it'll be a wiki. It's going to be a place where you can go uh, quickly as a support agent to write down known answers to, you know, uh, known problems and things like that. And it also gives users the chance to self-serve. Maybe they don't even need to talk to a support agent, right? They can just search the wiki. And uh, the feel of this, you know, where we want this to go is that it begins to feel something like the Bitcoin wiki, actually. We may expand that wiki beyond the knowledge base and really make it the BISC wiki that, um, you know, has more than just kind of, you know, support articles, knowledge base kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the template there is the Bitcoin wiki, which I think anybody who's familiar with knows that it's quite a valuable resource and we want to have the same kind of thing here. We'll figure out the relationship between our existing docs and website and the wiki and so on. We'll make sure all that makes sense. But you know, we're building that out now. 
And, uh, and what are we gonna measure? Well, again, what do users care about? How long does it take me to get a response? So somebody shows up in Keybase and says help, does it take an hour or does it take a day? Right, and we'll measure that and get the number just as low as we can, of course. And uh, of course, time to resolution. So yeah, you got a first response, now how long does it take to actually close the issue? And that's gonna vary widely depending on the problem, but we'll figure out a way to measure it that makes sense. And reliability, right? So I just wanted to define a couple of things here. Uh, this term phrase I'm using, core use case, right? This is anything that a user needs to do in BISC to successfully trade or manage their funds, like you know, send Bitcoin to get Bitcoin out of your BISC wallet, et cetera. So there are lots and lots of features and bells and whistles in BISC, but these core use cases that have to do with managing money and actually successfully trading, that's what I mean when I say this. And I define that because I want to now define what I'm calling a critical bug, uh, which is any issue that prevents you as a user from completing a core use case, right? So you can't get a trade done because of this issue, this bug, this problem, or it repeatedly lands users in support and or it puts user funds or privacy at risk. So what we want to do, and you know, there are just a number of outstanding bugs like this that are really sticky, really tricky, hard to solve problems. Um, others are not as hard, they're newer, right? But in any case, we want to now prominently track this, right? You know, like picture the uh, uh, days since last incident sign that you see in a factory or a plant, right? You know, zero days since last injury or 158 days since last uh, incident or injury, right? You wanna have that kind of feeling, right? There's a place where critical bugs are just very prominently tracked and we give them the highest priority uh, for getting fixed um, when it comes to things like allocating budget, right? And just, you know, sort of every dev has it in mind, like these really are the most important things in most cases. Um, and to support all of that, like I mentioned, we put devs in L2 support, so we've got skin in the game, right? Nothing's more irritating to a developer than having to solve the same problem twice, right? Uh, so, you know, we want to automate, we want to fix things, and by forcing ourselves to really be there every time, I have a feeling things are going to get fixed. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and how will we know that we do that? We'll, we'll measure things like how many critical bug incidents happened in this DAO cycle, right? We have a roughly monthly cycle based on Bitcoin blocks, right? How many bug incidents, incidents happened essentially this month? And uh, critical bug incidents per trade, right? So a kind of ratio. Did we have a thousand uh, trades, you know, this, 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 this uh, week or this month or what have you? And were there three critical bugs or did we have, um, you know, a thousand trades and we had uh, 30, you know, something like that? So the, the ratio matters because, of course, the number of trades differs from cycle to cycle. Um, okay, and the onboarding experience, right? This critical user experience moment. The, the first, my journey to first trade with BISC experience, right? What is that like? Well, right now, people just have to figure it out, right? They kind of open up BISC and they're presented with this really capable looking UI that looks like over their head in many cases, right? And that ends up turning people away. They have to figure out how to set up trading accounts, fund security deposits, and a number of other things. It's in the end just not trivial, right? For even for experienced Bitcoiners, it's not necessarily trivial. And we have docs on this, but docs aren't enough, right? That's not what users expect these days to need to go read a manual. It's important to have the docs, but they're not they're necessary but not sufficient, right? So we know we have the feedback, it's obvious, and uh, users deserve a first class onboarding experience on par with you know, any modern desktop or mobile application. And the good news is our amazing designer, uh, Pedro, has already designed all of this for us. He has this knack of just dropping incredibly great design work uh, at our feet and saying, Go for it, right? It's you know, just brilliant. So, Pedro, if you're listening, we love you. And uh, it's uh, what you're about to see is a part of a, a larger redesign of the whole desktop UI. Now, in practice, we're probably going to separate this out. Probably not going to do the whole redesign and the onboarding at the same time. We're probably going to do the onboarding flow in the current design, uh, which is also Pedro's work, not too bad. And um, 
and then we'll do the full redesign later, right? Just in the name of, you know, uh, getting things done and, and being incremental about it. So, you know, we need to implement that. We need to prioritize that. And I just want to show you a little bit about what it looks like, right? So you can imagine very first user opening this for the first time that they get presented with something like this, right? You know, kind, the kind of wizard, kind of onboarding flow that you're very used to as a modern user. So, you know, they're going to walk through step one, step two, step three, you know, making sure that they've set up their seed phrases, et cetera, creating a trading account, right? So, you know, going through and setting up your payment methods for, you know, USD trading or what have you, whatever altcoins you want to trade and so forth, right? They succeed through all that and they say, okay, great, you're ready to trade. What do you want to do? And then you're presented, right, with the more general kind of UI where you can go and go through these different use cases, create an offer, buy Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. So how are we going to know that that's effective? What are we going to measure? Well, new offers per active node, right? We, you know, it's possible for us to get how many data on how many active nodes are there on the disk network, it's essentially public information. Um, well, and it's also possible for us to monitor the offer book, right? So how many new offers are showing up total as a ratio against how many active nodes are there, right? And that'll give us a sense of how comfortable, how capable are users of actually creating offers, right? Um, trades per active node. So how many of those offers actually do get taken as a trade? And that gives us a sense of how motivated uh, people are to actually trade. Do they actually go through with it, right? Okay, so these are, these are the goals, right? And there's a kind of theme here overall, right? that 2020, or at least the first part of it, needs to be about growth. It needs to be about us focusing, focusing, identifying the right stuff and getting it done, right? Focusing and executing like we, have, like we haven't done before, right? We need to up our game in that. And really it's about nailing the fundamentals, right? You know, we're, we're, we're this works, right? You know, and, and, and it has users and, but we need to nail down the core stuff, right? There really does need to be sufficient liquidity for people when they show up to actually get through the trade or trades that they want to and need to. Um, if we're not getting that right, we're doing it wrong, right? So nail down the fundamentals. And from that base, right, if we can build that solid foundation, then we can go achieve these big opportunities, right? And we can have much bigger, much more ambitious goals. But this, you know, we need to start here. So uh, those are the goals, right? What are the changes that we're rolling out right now? So think organizational changes. Um, starting now, we're in the middle of Dow cycle 10 or toward the beginning of Dow cycle 10. So these things are gonna take effect now, but they're gonna, take some time to roll out completely, right? So uh, let me tell you what they are. So the first thing is teams. Uh, we've been a totally flat organization, particularly since we launched the DAO. Now we wanna introduce a bit of hierarchy, right? Just enough management, we hope, to help us actually achieve what we need to achieve, right? Some management, as it turns out, for our stage, for our level of maturity, is actually necessary. That's like a lesson that we've learned. Right. So what are the teams? Well, an admin team, right? Taking care of all the kind of internal stuff that we do, roles and proposals and compensation, making sure all that stuff is running smoothly, other key DAO infrastructure, and also setting, you know, like we're doing on this call, setting the high level, you know, goals for the whole project, uh, set, you know, managing the overall budget, et cetera. Uh, dev. Pretty obvious, that's everything from development itself, testing, bug fixes, shipping releases, exactly what you would expect. Growth team has been around for, it, it, there has sort of been a growth team for a long time in this, but now we kind of formalize it. Um, running the website, et cetera, all the, all the sort of liquidity efforts, events that we put on, et cetera. And uh, ops, right? So keeping all of the BISC network's critical infrastructure running. 
Now, there's a number of, of operators out there, right? People who play operator roles inside of the DAO are, you know, seed node operators, price node operators, people who have control over our different, um, you know, domain names, DNS. All of that stuff is broken out in roles. So it's very much decentralized. Like a large number of people have control individually over these different pieces and parts. So we're not centralizing that stuff, but we're, but we're introducing some oversight of it, right? So that we can coordinate those players a little bit better. We're not like in-housing, you know, into our own data center or something like that, all of our operations, not at all. Um, okay, and support, right? Which we've just talked a lot about. So that's, you know, basically everybody who's helping users support agents right you know pri primarily working in keybase support channel mediators that are working in app uh our refund agent for people who end up in refund cases uh and uh documentation as well especially as we start building up the knowledge base right that that kind of documentation what users go to to solve problems and so on so you can see all of this reflected uh, in GitHub, in our GitHub organization, the BISC network organization, is now broken down in terms of these teams. And there are sub-teams, right, for all the different, for example, operator roles and so on. Um, but this is actually reflected. We don't just have to draw boxes on an org chart. We actually have a system to support this kind of thing. And uh, so leads for each team, who are those people? Well, I'm Chris Beams. I'm leading the admin team. and uh, Christoph is leading dev. Uh, Steve, Jane, is leading growth, as he always has, essentially. Wiz is running all things ops. And uh, support is a, is a TBD, right? It, it, that doesn't have a name next to it. And currently, it's a shared function amongst the other team leads. So we're definitely pushing that ball forward. And uh, we'll see who ends up filling that role in a uh, first-class way down the road. Okay, so what does a team lead do? Well, primarily they're setting team priorities, right? Sort of aligned with these larger priorities, top level goals. Okay, what does my team need to do to support that, right? Uh, making decisions about the budget that they're allocated. We're gonna talk more about budget in a minute. Um, and this one's really key, I think, for scaling the DAO. It, reviewing their team's compensation requests, right? So right now it is a kind of implicit uh, you know, obligation or, or expectation that, um, you know, all contributors are potentially reviewing all compensation requests and proposals that come into the DAO in every DAO cycle. You know, this last cycle, there was, I think, 43 proposals of one kind or another, and it just doesn't scale to have every contributor sort of needing to look over all of those things. Um, everybody still can do that. Everybody can still vote. Every stakeholder can still vote on every compensation request and proposal. And when you know things, you should, right? If you're, uh, you know, educated about a particular uh, proposal, well, of course, you should vote. You should weigh in. But now, going forward, there's, a, you know, you can breathe a big sigh of relief because the, the idea is that we count on team leads. That's part of their role is to review, make sure that the things that are being, you know, when compensation is being requested, it's actually delivered work, right? Per our definition of delivered, it's. Uh, within budget, it's work that was prioritized, i.e. given budget, right? And you know, anywhere there's anomalies, uh, the team lead is you know, gonna jump on that and make sure to, to smooth things out or clear up any misunderstandings or what have you. So one of the implications of this is that you know, if you're a contributor submitting compensation requests every cycle, you're, you're gonna wanna do it earlier probably. That, you know, some people do it early already. You won't wanna be doing it on the last day anymore because you really need to make sure your team lead has time to go through everything and get back to you for any revisions and so on. So team leads will say more about that. Again, we'll smooth all this out and roll all this out as we go, but that's just kind of a hint. And of course, uh, team leads are responsible for coordinating their efforts across the whole organization with the other team leads. So no big surprises what a team lead would do. All right, so let's talk about budget. This is a uh, high level snapshot of the budget that we're now working with as of cycle 10. So you can see the kind of history here. Just one moment. So cycle seven, right? Cycle eight, cycle nine, and now. That's what we're looking at. So these are, you know, real historical numbers and they haven't been 
too crazy um, most of the time, right? So $58,000 worth of BSQ was issued in cycle seven. So we denominate here in USD because the price of BSQ fluctuates. You know, USD is more stable so that we can actually manage to it. Um, so we issued about $60,000 worth of BSQ in compensation in cycle seven. Uh, and that's been you know, roughly consistent with the previous cycles, um, more or less a number like that. Then in cycle eight, boom, you know, 100,000. The big, big difference. So you know, this is one of the uh, drivers to making some of these changes. We just can't let that happen. We, we cannot let it happen that uh, you know, from one cycle to the next, we're just uh, inflating the BSQ supply in an uncontrolled way. Uh, so, so, you know, that's a lot of what this budget is about is making sure that that sort of thing doesn't happen. Right. And that we stay on point with our, you know, kind of runway here. Um, cycle nine actually turned things around quite a bit already. It was, was pretty low. And, you know, we just looked at these historicals and said, okay, what do we think a reasonable number is going forward as a, as a baseline, right? We're going to have to adjust this as we go, probably, but $60,000 worth of budget for the org. Uh, in cycle 10 and onward and until we realize that that's sort of no longer a reasonable number and it's broken down across the teams in these ways. And I won't go into more detail about it here, but you can certainly talk to your, to your team leads about it or you know, ask about it in key days. Okay, so priorities. We talked about the goals, right? So the goals are sort of highest level strategic stuff that we you know, must get done as an organization. But inside of those goals were, you know, tactics. What are we going to do to actually achieve that stuff? Well, this is where it gets down to brass tacks. What are we actually going to give priority and focus on to the exclusion of other things, right? So I just want to define priority for our purposes, right? That priorities are units of work that have been allocated budget and are therefore eligible for compensation in you know the current this DAO cycle, or perhaps in a subsequent DAO cycle, whenever that work actually gets delivered, you know not all work gets done within a single cycle. Some things may take longer, but it's going forward it's going to be very important that you've actually gotten a green light. Hey, this is on point with our goals. This really is a priority. We want to ship this thing that you're doing, whatever it is. Uh, so please do go ahead and have a reasonable expectation of compensation granted that you actually deliver, right? You and the people you're working with actually deliver that. So that's what I mean when I say priority. And just to, to give a sense, right? Like there's a set of priorities that are essentially fixed, like unchanging, right? Things like keep the infrastructure up, provide great user support, fix critical bugs, right? Ship regularly. And then, okay, assuming all those things are going as they should, work on whatever the current cycle priorities are, are which shift over time, right? As things get done and new things get prioritized. So what are some of the current cycle priorities now? Well, they had better be aligned with these goals or the goals are meaningless. So you can see I've kind of broken it down that way. Well, building out the daemon in API, certainly a priority for all the reasons we've talked about. The growth efforts to support all of that, like really getting in touch with market makers, attracting them to the project, et cetera. Uh, as a kind of experiment in liquidity, we just listed LBTC. Some may have heard of that, right? We want to just see how much interest is there in that. You know, maybe that opens up a new channel of liquidity uh, in, in volume. Let's see, right? Um, support, okay. One of the tactics was build out this knowledge base. We've begun doing that. That's in flight. That certainly has priority. Uh, reliability. So just a couple of the things that we've done around reliability this cycle is um, we've built out what, what we're calling trade process refresh, right? So if for some reason a certain step in a given trade fails, right, because you know a message didn't broadcast or didn't get to the peer for whatever reason, you can now kind of refresh that, resend that in the effort of, you know, in, in, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, being able to complete that trade, right, not having to go to mediation or support about it. Um, and with regard to onboarding, we're still mostly in the conversation phase about exactly how to build out the onboarding, but we're already uh, looking at sort of prototyping and playing with how are we going to do the, 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 the monitoring and the metrics that we need 
to actually measure that that's that that effort is a success. So, uh, so that's well aligned work, right? We're going to need to do that. And uh, you know, this is just a quick list, but uh, one structure that, I'm, that we're building out for this is a is a GitHub uh, project board for people who are familiar with that. You know, kind of Kanban board style that that you know GitHub has support for now. Um, so there's a priorities board that I'm currently playing with. It's just private right now. I'll make it public soon, but I think we're going to go with something like this, which is basically the you know single place right across the whole organization, across all repositories, etc., where you can get a quick look at okay, what has priority? What's being worked on right now? What's sort of waiting to be worked on, right? You know, stalled on resources, but it has priority if only someone can pick it up. Okay, and what have we gotten done, right? Um, so basically, if you're working on something and you want to get paid for it, you should probably be on this board in one form or another, right? So that's a, going to be a, a way to sanity check uh, what you're up to. Um, so on that point, right, changes to contribution and compensation. So want to set a kind of new default, right? I've already articulated this a couple of times in this talk, but but it's a bit of a reset, right? That you want to think about contributions are not by default eligible for compensation unless they've been prioritized, unless they have budget, right? And there's just, there's just no way to manage it otherwise without a whole lot of uh, thrashing, right? So if you, if, if you want to contribute and you want to issue compensation requests, simply make sure that you've got that green light ahead of time, right? This is a lot about conversation, right? This is not like super heavy process and you know, having to fill out a bunch of forms or something like that. It's about being in communication with the relevant team lead or team leads maybe, and really making sure that there's alignment, that this is important enough to green light for the limited budget that we have, right? To the exclusion of other things, and go for it. Now, of course, anybody can still work on whatever they want. It's an open source project. Anybody can issue pull requests for anything, et cetera, right? But we need to have this mental shift that there's no expectation that that contribution is going to be compensated just because it's there, just because you did a good job, right? Really doesn't need to get budget. Um, and uh, you know, to, to that same end, we're, we're gonna, you know, Dev is gonna be more rigorous going forward with new PRs, right? We have a pretty steady pulse of uh, new contributors coming along, you know, uh, doing this work or that work, not necessarily asking about it beforehand, maybe asking about it beforehand. And uh, that's all great, right? That sort of shows that the project is interesting to people. And of course we, in a way we really like that, right? You want that kind of activity around the project, but at the same time, it costs Dev to do that. It requires review, it requires conversation, it requires rework. And uh, you know, very often, too often, PRs come in that are, just, that are just not above the bar, right? They're just not good enough for us to say, okay, this is really worth my time, I'll stop what I'm working on, I'll go review this, I'll you know, sort of steward this into getting merged, right? We need to be more clear upfront, more rigorous about this. So I like to talk about being both direct and decent with people. Being clear, right? Hey, this probably isn't gonna get any priority. I've taken a look at it and I'm not going to take much more of a look at it, right? We have to figure out how to, how to develop that capacity, that culture, right? That uh, we just must not waste time. And we have to have a definition of what is wasting time, right? What's a priority? What are we focusing on? And what are we not? If we don't have that, then we get distracted and pulled in a thousand directions. And we just don't have the people uh, to allow for that. Maybe we will in the future, right? We don't know. So uh, changes to roles and bonds very quickly. So we are, um, you know, after this call, we're going to roll out. A, a, just a review of all the roles. You know, there are a lot of roles, right? We've really broken things down, all the roles and responsibilities. We're gonna review all of those and make sure that there's documentation in place for each role, that those role duties are actually being fulfilled by role owners, and that role owners are bonded where appropriate. Many have bonded um, properly and many haven't, right? And so that's a, you know, a case of failure of management, 
really, this is, this is on us to make sure that there's rigor and there's you know, adherence to these uh, internal structures that we've built in the DAO. So we'll do that, right? We'll be reaching out to each role owner. We'll be asking role owners to be responsible for their role documentation if it's not present. Role documentation is not complicated. It's usually just a few bullet points of what are your duties, what are your rights and privileges, et cetera, right? Um, so we'll tighten all that stuff up. And uh, a couple points on communication. One, uh, lots of people already know that uh, many of us are now doing a kind of daily stand-up, um, you know, in the sense that lots of software teams do it, a kind of stand-up meeting, but of course we're distributed, so we're just doing it in a key-based channel called stand-up. And the idea is if you're actively working on BISC, uh, post an update every day that you're actually working that just says, what did you do? What are you planning to do tomorrow? What's in your way of getting stuff done, right? Just classic stand-up stuff. And you know, we really think this is the bare minimum for a team like ours to stay in touch. And it has this magical effect of actually feeling like a team. You know, you see everybody around you. There's a pulse, right? And it's not too distracting. It doesn't waste a bunch of time. It's just a couple sentences, right? And it also gives the opportunity to catch something like, oh, that's already being worked on. Or, oh, hey, does that have budget, right? You know, like a team lead could catch that and say, and you could say, oh, no, it doesn't, but it's fine. That's what I'm doing anyway. I don't care. Whatever, right? But we need to be in communication at, at least that level. So please do, if you're not already, start that practice, right? Just post something in stand up every day uh, that you actually are contributing, you're actually working. Um, yeah, and that's just what it looks like, right? You know, I'm sure most of the people on this call that are contributors are in Keybase already. And, uh, and I wanna talk about um, using the mailing list, the BISContrib mailing list. Some may have noticed people that are already subscribed there, you know, I've posted a few things lately. And I think that we are uh, essentially missing a kind of important communication channel. Uh, Keybase is great, has lots of people there and lots of messages, but no one should feel like they have to catch up with Keybase every day. It's essentially ephemeral. That's the nature of such chat mediums, and that's good, right? But we want to have some kind of channel. Like, you know, if this were a company, we would have a list all mailing list, and, you know, big important announcements in the company would be made there. And of course, everybody reads that. It's a total expectation that everybody reads that. So we want to have something like that. And the structure that we have already in place is a BISCONTRIB mailing list. So, you know, don't introduce anything new. Just an ask to everybody here. Um, please do go subscribe if you're not already. And, um, you know, we can figure out from there any future kind of you know, communication changes. But you know, a place to make important announcement, announcements, maybe a place to have sort of more discussions and ideas, right? Maybe we need another mailing list for that, let's see. But um, I think we're kind of missing that structure. I've certainly been missing it. So that's that. And uh, just takeaways, right? So these changes, you know, there's a number of changes I just talked about. They're all works in progress. Wanting to announce them all so everybody's on board, everybody can ask questions about it, whatever. It's gonna take a little time, right? To really roll it out, fully integrate. So please be patient with that. Share updates and stand up, subscribe to BISCONTRIB. Uh, make sure you know whether your work has priority. And uh, you know, be in communication. If you're in doubt about anything, any of this, just ask, right? Talk to your team lead, ask me, whatever. And uh, yeah, feedback, welcome, please. So last thing I wanna talk about is, what does BISC need as a project, right? If you're somebody listening to this and you're not already a contributor, you're thinking about it, or uh, et cetera, well, it's pretty simple. We need very strong Java developers. We need the kind of developers that can show up into a complex project like BISC and figure it out. Figure out what needs to be done. Figure out how to solve problems, right? This is not a trivial thing. It's a fairly rarefied air here, and we need those people. We've been very blessed to have a few of them show up, right? We want more of them to show up, and we want them to stick around. So if you're one of those people, well, certainly um, come talk to me, come talk to us. And if you know any of those people, they're like, you know, people that are really passionate or just really interested in Bitcoin, like they think they want to get into this space. And maybe they're coming from a career long, super strong history with Java, with open source, et cetera. Please do point them our direction. And uh, uh, we need additional support agents, right? So if you're somebody who 
you may be a user of BISC, you'd like to get involved, you know something about it, you're familiar with the app, maybe you'd like to really learn more, right? Support is a great place to learn, actually. You can really help people and learn at the same time. So consider that. And like I've mentioned all throughout this, we need market makers. So if you're somebody, especially if you're somebody uh, technically minded and you think you might wanna be using this API that we're building, come talk to us, right? Come talk to us about your use cases. Come be an early adopter of it. Okay, so, um, well, I hope you get the sense, right, uh, of what we're trying to do here. And that 2020 can really be about uh, growth for us in a nutshell, right? Um, yeah, I hope you like what you've seen. Um, come talk to me about anything in here. And thanks very much for attending. This call uh, has been recorded and it'll be published to YouTube just afterward. That's our uh, YouTube channel. And the um, link to this slide will also be published in the, in the show notes there. So you can come back and uh, review everything here. Okay, thanks everyone very much. Uh, and we can open it up to uh, Q&A. We're almost at the hour, but um, I'm certainly happy to stick around for some minutes and do that. So I wanna try something here, which is um, to actually open up the Q&A. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, so I wanna start a new Q&A session. And so you can now see, you're probably looking at my, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Are, are you, I'm not sure if you're looking at my whole screen. Let me, let me make sure. So I'm gonna show you my whole desktop. I think that's the only way to do it. And um, so you can now see that and you can see that. So if you wanna ask a question, you can go here and just type it in. Um, you can also just unmute and ask it, but if you'd like to do it this way, then you know, I can see everybody's questions and, and cruise through them. So I'm gonna leave that link up, and yeah, the link is also right here too. So feel free to type away. Also, feel free to um, you know, just unmute and ask. Who decides on the priorities? Yeah, good question. So ultimately at this point, it's been this body of team leads, right? We got this together and called some shots that we think are you know, reasonable and that probably everybody can get aligned with. Um, and it will continue to be that body, but you know, it's not a, a, I don't know, closed door, smoking cigars or whatever, right? It's in communication with everybody, right? You know, team leads are working with their team members. We wanna stay in touch with the community, right? But there does need to be some function that determines this ought to be done, at least this ought to be budgeted for, right? Actually eligible for compensation to the exclusion of other things, or you know, we get the kind of results that we've that we've been getting. So I hope that answers the question. Is the budget fixed forever? No, certainly not. Um, it starts at $60,000 worth of BSQ, uh, whatever the BSQ market price is. Um, but, uh, you know, as conditions change, right? You know, especially if we're, if the team is growing, right? If we do bring on some of those strong developers that we would love to have, and we're now able to do more, right? Add more value for users. Well, it follows that we should have a bit more budget, right? But the thing is we want to be we want to be very consistent here right so right now sixty thousand dollars worth of bsq is more revenue than we make right so that number even though it's a controlled budget is going to continue to inflate the bsq supply in in a controlled way right so we want to have that expectation out there for stakeholders and people who you know are interested in bsq they should know that, right? The supply is gonna to continue to inflate a bit. You know, we started at 3.6 million BSQ at the Genesis in uh, April of 2019, and we're now at about 3.9 million. So we've had 300,000 BSQ total worth of inflation of the supply over that nearly one year time period, nine month time period, right? So a couple of those cycles were too much, right? More than, more than we could justify, more than we could be comfortable with. But like any startup, 
right? We're going to have a kind of runway where, you know, we're spending more than we make. And the idea is not just to get to break even, right? But that eventually that trend line begins to go down, right? The total BSQ supply begins to trend down and BSQ becomes deflationary, right? We're essentially producing more value, right? Users are paying more in BSQ than we're charging to do our work. That's the game here. That's the idea. So we're going to, you know, manage the budget in accordance with what's prudent with that larger overall goal. So 60,000 is not fixed. It can grow or shrink, right? Just depending on what we need. But we're going to keep that big picture in mind, right? And we'll track to it. Okay, uh, how do we join a team? Um, well, we should talk, <laughs> right? Uh, what is it that you want to do? Are you already doing something? Um, like if you're already playing a certain role uh, in BISC, well, then you, you're implicitly already part of whatever team that role is a part of, right? So that'll just sort of be automatic. Um, there's more to be done inside of GitHub in the details of all those teams. But if you're asking kind of from coming out of the blue, right, like you're somebody interested in contributing and you'd like to join, say, I don't know, the ops team, well, it's just a conversation you have to have. What needs to be done in ops? Here's what I'm good at. Um, Da, 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 right. So I, I hope that answers that. And um, non-custodial lightning trades need to be done with the BISC v 2.0 trading pro protocol. Maybe, maybe not. Right. The reason that I answered that in the opportunities section is, you know, lots of people have asked about lightning. We've all thought about lightning a little bit, at least. Right. It's a kind of obvious question. What's BISC's lightning story going to be? Will BISC have a lightning story? Does the way BISC does things comport with lightning, right? Is it compatible in some way with lightning? Can it be adapted to lightning? We don't know the answer to that, right? We, we simply have not had enough time and resources to really do the thinking. That's possible if we can move through these challenges, right? And we can grow. So I answered that not because we have some deep plan about how to do it, but really to make the point that we want to have such a plan. These are things that are real opportunities for us. You know, if we can you know, build this foundation that I'm talking about. Um, will this team lead structure budget be around forever? Yeah, I mean, everything evolves, right? Everything changes. So this is an initial structure and it's subject to change just like anything else, just based on what, what works, right? It's all about figuring out what works. What are the minimum programming skills uh, and availability to be useful to the support team? Very interesting question. Um, programming skills are not required per se, right? It helps if you're technically minded. It helps if you have a kind of model of how an application works and um, how BISC functions and so on. You sort of have a, a mind that's um, capable of like reading about that stuff and kind of taking it on board. But you know, you typically support. Uh, agents as a function of that role are not doing any coding really um, but they all tend to be more or less tech technically minded um, at least able to reason about this and um, availability uh, availability varies right what matters most at this point I think is that there's a non-trivial amount of time available like let's say um, just for a number right uh, three or four hours a day right, would be very useful to the team potentially, or, you know, larger chunks of time, two times a week or three times a week or something. Can't be just like a once a month, you know, kind of stop by, or, you know, just an hour here or an hour there randomly. That ends up probably creating more overhead than it's worth. Uh, I can't say for sure, but that's a gut feeling. Um, but especially as we build out these calendars, I mean, what we're going to try to do is build 24 seven coverage, right? So anytime, any day, any customer, you know, or user shows up, uh, there's somebody there to at least initially respond to them, right. And help guide them in the right direction. Um, so, you know, if you've got uh, three hours a day available or four hours a day, three times a week or something like that, Hey, that could be very useful. When will the API be released and what are its functions? I'm going to, uh, Let's see. Yeah, we've got a few more questions. I'll try to answer the ones that remain and we'll go for five more minutes or so. Um, when will the API be released and what are its functions? So the uh, 
so I don't know. I don't know when the API will be released. It's actually stalled right now on dev resources. Uh, this, is, this is actually a personal responsibility of mine. I took on that work um, starting a couple of months ago, but I put it on hold to take on this role. And it remains to be seen. It's one of my top priorities after this call, right? To return to that and figure out, okay, how do we push the ball forward, right? You know, do, do I do some amount more work and then hand it off? Simply don't know, but it has the utmost priority uh, to me. And um, what are its functions in general? You want to think, okay, what can I do with this? Well, you can probably ultimately do that in the API. We'll do it incrementally, right? So you want to think about things like, you know, from the most basic, what's my ba what's the balance of my wallet, right? That would be like the most basic thing. Or like, what version is this BISC daemon running? You know, a get version call or a get balance call. You know, very, very simple stuff up to, you know, core use cases, right? What's, uh, you know, you want to place an offer to sell this many Bitcoin in exchange for euros and, you know, with this distance from market price and so on and so forth, right? All those things you can do in the UI will be represented in the API on an, you know, as needed, most important stuff first, iterative kind of basis. We'll release a, an, a, an MVP, right? A minimum viable product with, you know, enough core use cases to, to do something. And based on feedback, we'll continue and continue and continue. Dangers of BSQ stock buybacks with BTC from fees to sustain BSQ value. Um, I don't know about that. I, I'm not sure that there's such a danger. I'm not sure that any such thing is happening. I'm, I'm gonna punt. I simply don't know. And if you wanna talk more about it, please come to Keybase. Um, it, in any case, it, that's not a, an item that has been in my head, like something to manage or something to mitigate. Um, will the budget automatically be adjusted to match the revenue? Well, yeah, certainly have an effect, right? Um, you know, particularly as, as uh, you know, revenues match expenses, okay, well, yeah, we can increase the budget uh, accordingly, right? As we actually are in the green, well, of course we can increase the budget, right? Keeping in mind that we want to achieve this gradual deflationary trend for BSQ over, over time, right? So yeah, we could raise it, but if we have that wherewithal, if we have that, you know, if we've achieved that luxury of being a profitable organization, well, the last thing we want to do is get crazy and start inflating the supply, right? We need to create uh, for everybody involved a, a, a plausible promise of a deflationary future for BSQ, right? That really is the game. So, um, you know, if we get profitable, probably the last thing we're gonna do is, uh, you know, start breaking the budget and going above our revenues, right? Just, I'm just giving a sketch here. I'm not saying never, but uh, hopefully you get the thinking behind it. Uh, what's the best way to contact the team to discuss non-technical roles? Yeah, come to Keybase, the BISC Keybase team if you're not already in there and um, introduce yourself. There's an introductions channel. Say what you're interested in, say what, what you're good at, what are your skills, what's your background, and um, what are you thinking about? How would you like to contribute? And there's certainly, certainly non-technical uh, roles that people do play and non-technical contributions that people make, so absolutely. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go about one more minute. And as far as feedback goes, is BISC's app resource consumption satisfactory um i read this as a question asking about like are we do we think it's satisfactory like the resources that this consumes on a, on a you know a typical user machine um well no i mean we we certainly know that there are issues that people are experiencing with like lots of ram you know usage and possibly memory leaks causing that and so on we're you know tracking those things down like as we speak um some are pretty tricky but um, in general, you know, I didn't list it out here explicitly, performance, but in practice, performance really has been a priority for us, um, you know, over the last year, for sure. Um, and, and it'll continue to, it's, in, in the most important cases, it is essentially falling under reliability. You know, if you end up, this ends up blowing up for you with an out of memory error, right? 
it's a reliability issue. I mean, it's an extreme case, but um, but no, we're you know hell bent on on uh, you know reducing resource consumption uh, wherever we can. So it it is an ongoing um, priority and likely to be green lit, right? Especially where it, where it's causing real pain for users. Um, okay, I might have missed this, but any news on Back Thirty Two? No, unfortunately, it remains stalled. This is one of the key areas where we really need developers, right? We don't just need developers, right? Like I said, we need a strong developer who can come in and really grok the situation that we have with Bitcoin J, right? We have a custom fork of Bitcoin J. We have done things to Bitcoin J for our purposes that we need to preserve, that we need to be mindful of. We cannot simply upgrade to the newest version of Bitcoin J that has SegWit support and then just do a kind of vanilla upgrade to it. It's more complicated than that. We don't have a Bitcoin J expert on the team right now, and we need one, right? So that's just the situation. We know how much people want it. I want it, right? And it remains on our, on our dashboard. I'm not saying stop asking about it, but unfortunately the answer is no presence activity. Uh, okay, and from Flix, make these my last ones. Uh, will this do any marketing outreach communication referral program? Uh, I would leave that one to Steve to answer. I think generally the answer is yes, but I'm not exactly sure we have in mind there. So I'll leave it to Steve. You guys can talk to this. And is anyone currently working on a BISC mobile app? I mean, here's the thing. The answer to that question is yes, we are going to do those kinds of programs. I'm just going to be speaking out of school if I try to speak to them specifically. So if you're interested in getting involved in any of those kind of referral programs and so on, come talk to us. Come talk to Steve. He's M52Go in Keybase. Just ask around for Steve and you'll find him. Go talk in the growth channel uh, and get involved that way. And uh, is anyone currently working on a BISC mobile app? Uh, no, not actively. But what we do have is designs for it from our most excellent Pedro designer, uh, that look great. And we know, uh, you know, roughly technically what we want to do, which is like the first BISC mobile app that we would ship would be essentially a light remote client, right? You'd have your BISC node running at home on a VPS on a Raspberry Pi, whatever it is that you want to do. And you'd be able to access that in a fully featured way. Uh, remotely. We have a BISC notifications app for iOS and, and Android, which is very simple and it just pings you when there's any change in your trade status, like a trade's been taken or the next step in the trade process is completed or you have an arbitration remediation message, et cetera. So that's already out there, but the sort of fully featured light client, remote client, um, we certainly have in mind. It's a key thing we want to build on top of the API, but the API has got to get there first. Okay. Um, Wow, great, great questions. Thanks everybody for attending. I see there's 25 participants. I don't know how, how many we had um, as a total or, or with the highest, hi, levels, but that's great. Yeah, hello. Hi, can I just say hi to the team? Um, yeah, so, just, so you know the face is behind all well, mm. the mediator yeah. and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, pleasure. So that's uh, Leo, one of the people yep. uh, doing hi, support guys. mediation. Hi Leo, thanks for saying hi. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's call it good. And uh, thanks again for attending. All right, everybody. Bye-bye.